Well, we've been looking at uh, The Greatest Prayer by John Dominic Crossan. The, um, the first chapter of, of the, the book was basically an overview of the way that uh, we have been introduced to prayer in uh, the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. We saw in the Old Testament that there were two types of prayer. One was associated primar primarily with the Psalms. And those were prayers of petition and gratitude. And Crossan wants to make it very clear that there's nothing wrong with those prayers. However, what is left out is a second aspect of prayer that needs to follow up almost in a, uh, or simultaneously. And that is what the, uh, the prophets were so interested in. And when I say prophets, I mean Amos and Hosea, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Nearly all of the prophets have a concern for doing the will of God in, uh, in the world, uh, especially among the people of Israel, but also in the world in general. It was the prophets, really, who were the first ones who began to think in a more universal way that the God of the Israelites, though many would try to own him as kind of a national tribal God, was really Far more than that, they were the first to begin to think of about uh, about monotheism properly. You know that there is one God, and the God of Israel is that God. Uh, we saw in Deuteronomy, you know, what we call the Shema, the prayer, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." Um, meaning, there is one God, and there are no other gods that should be worshipped. We, we see that, of course, in the Ten Commandments, but that particular verse in Deuteronomy was a result of the work of this king I'm going to introduce on Sunday. His name is Josiah, and what he did was to bring the scribes of Israel together to write a national narrative uh, so that the people had a sense of their own identity vis-a-vis -vis the, the temple, the king, uh, and their um identity in the world to, to do God's God, God's will according to the covenant. covenant. Um, it was the prophets, of course, who were going to recognize how that, that, that wonderful project, you know, giving people identity can have its downside. In other words, that they come to see themselves connected primarily with a geographical city state and all of its trappings of of uh you know of politics and law and not so much with the covenant the covenant idea that says regardless <laughs> of where you are in the world geographically you are can still be identified as people of god by these 10 very basic things that you acknowledge and these are the 10 commandments so this really introduces this uh, this conflict, we might say, in uh, the history of Israel. What does it mean to be an Israelite, or as we call them today, what does it mean to be a Jew? Does it mean to follow? Uh, does it mean to identify yourself with this geopolitical uh, entity that we call Israel today, or does it mean to follow God's covenant, regardless of where you are? Uh, in in the world, and it was going to be the prophets, people like Amos and and uh, Hosea and Isaiah and Micah, were going to first introduce this idea of the universal God. And not only that, that there is another way to pray. Yes, prayers of petition and prayers of thanksgiving are are um, absolutely essential. But God also wants God's people to be empowered to do the will of God. So prayers that ask for empowerment give us the strength to be your representatives, to be your heirs, literally, uh, your sons and daughters of God on earth to fulfill the will of God. Uh, this is the prayer that the prophets want to, um, uh, to introduce into that. So in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we have really three aspects of prayer, offering offering up to God our requests, offering up to God our thanks and our praise, but also opening ourselves to 
the spirit of God in doing what is required of all human beings created in the image of God, and that is following the covenant. And the third one is what often gets eclipsed. And thus the first two become, become almost, um, um, well, I mean, they just lose a facet of, of our calling uh, here as, as people of God. So um, are there any questions about that? That was the, kind of our first chapter. Because we're going to start getting into the prayer itself, the Lord's Prayer. Hey, Bill, thank you for calling back. <laughs> oh, that's Sharon. Okay. I'm going to mute you, Sharon, if you don't mind. Um, so we're going to look into the prayer that we often pray on Sunday. Uh, and, you know, it's so rote that we just kind of memorize it and we don't think about, you know, how it's structured. We don't think about uh, the theological aspects of what it says about God, what it says about us. And so this is why Crossan wrote this book. Um, and of course that prayer begins with uh, a, the very simple uh, acknowledgement that God is our father. Now, earlier we saw that though Jesus introduces this prayer in Matthew and elsewhere, a shorter version in Luke, it's not in Mark and it's not in John, but in Matthew and Luke, uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew because it's the longer prayer. Uh, Jesus introduces this prayer. But but remember, when Matthew was written, it was probably about 85 of the common era when a community of people associated with the disciple Matthew began to write down you know, their understanding of who Jesus was. Prior to that time, almost a generation before that, there was Paul who was writing. And Paul gives us an even shorter version of the uh, Lord's Prayer. And it's just two words, Abba, Father. Those two words are packed with meaning. They're packed with cultural meaning because Abba is an Aramaic term meaning father, but it's also it suggests an intimacy, you know, uh, like papa or daddy. But then the Greek word pater uh, is also used. So when, when Paul is introducing this prayer, we've got two languages that are being used. Aramaic, the language of the Jews, primarily the lingua, lingua franca of the, the, the Jews. But then there's also Greek, which was the lingua franca, franca of, the, of the Gentiles of the day. In those two words itself, we have an image of the universality of God as father. God as father of and giver of the covenant, but God is also creator of, of the world itself. And this prayer, is it, Crossan's going to keep coming back to this. This prayer is an invitation says Paul. It basically unlocks the door to allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to pray through us. This is the kind of empowerment that the prophets experienced, right? The Spirit of God grabs hold of them and they are able to do the will of God and speak the word of God, uh, not of their own will, but through the Spirit of God speaking through them. So Paul says, when we say this, these words, Abba, Father, we are opening ourselves up to the movement of the Spirit. Because if we, as we saw last time, we do not, as Paul says, we do not pray as we should. We don't know how to pray. We, we really don't. You know, our own ego and our own will gets caught up in it. But if we are truly heirs of God, you know, through Christ, we're heirs of God, then the Spirit prays for us. So there's this wonderful collaboration that goes on. And prayers, of course, are prayers that we say, but more importantly, prayers that we do. We are empowered not just to pray for things, but to do things. Just as God breathed the breath of life into Adam in the beginning, and Adam became a living being, so the words Abba Father become 
the opening of our mouth, so to speak, so that God can breathe the breath of life in us and we can actually be empowered to do the, the will of God. So even prior to Jesus introducing the Lord's Prayer, we have this prayer of Paul that's so important. Um, any thoughts about that before I move on? Kind of where we were last time. See Harvey's join us. Nice to see you, Harvey. Um, Crossan being the, the literary scholar, scholar that he is, I, I think I mentioned before that his, his dissertation wit, written back in the 60s was on the use of metaphor and parable uh, in the Bible, but especially in the New Testament. So what he's going to do is apply the, his literary skills uh, to the structure of the Lord's Prayer and in and, and so doing unfold aspects of the prayer that that may not you know, be evident to, to most of us and, you know, the workaday world. But the one thing he wants to make sure that we, we know, and that is that the Bible is, rises and falls on the use of metaphor. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to find that original quote that's so important, because this is really what Crossan is all about. My point, once again, he says, is not that those ancient people told literal stories and were now smart enough to take them symbolically. But they told them symbolically and now we're dumb enough to take them literally. <laughs> That's crossing. In other words, these were, these were people who, understanding that God cannot be defined and placed in a box, especially through language, saw the necessity of using metaphor. Metaphor is the means by which we say something and we get a sense that the thing that we're describing has an is and is not quality, right? Jesus is the Lamb of God. It's a metaphor that we know so well in the New Testament. Well, we know that Jesus is not a Lamb of God, but in many ways, Jesus is a Lamb of God. And so metaphor gives us a, a, the ability to say things in a way that might not uh, be said if we were simply to use descriptive or literal language. This is why poetry is so powerful. Uh, you know, it's not scientific. It's not describing the world in, in, in what's termed as critical realism, being as precise and succinct as possible. But it's giving us an intimation of the way things are. We see reality out of the corner of our eyes. As Dwight Marsh used to always remind me, uh, Emily Dickinson, says tell the truth but tell it slant right don't don't try to use critical realist uh, language but tell it using metaphor so when we speak about god who is the holy transcendent god is not contained in any type of definition or object or anything that we see in our world and if god is then that thing can become an idol so we must always recognize that when we talk about God, we're always going to be using metaphor. The metaphor that's supremely used, of course, of Jesus is the one that we just talked about, God as Father. And uh, Crossan once, I think if you read this chapter, you know that what Crossan is saying is really kind of hard to, to get a grasp on because I'm, I'm going to try to give you an example that we can relate to. Uh, but what he wants to say is when we hear the word father being used in the Lord's Prayer, we should not think of it in masculine terms. In the past, when people used to speak in, about anthropology, Denny, you, you were probably aware of this. When you were teaching your classes at Hastings College, when you referred to humanity in general, what term did you use? Man, right? The, the rise and fall yeah. of man. Yeah. Grud grudgingly, Dan. Oh, you did. I mean, can Grudging. you tell us about your transition? Did you were you always one who recognized the the, the limitation of that metaphor for uh, human beings? Um. I'd like to think so. Uh, probably a gradual thing in the beginning, but yeah. And um, 
you know, the Greek word anthropos does have a, this is the thing about the English language. We don't have um, gender ascribed to things. You know, when I was, when I was uh, a chaplain, I remember there was this little three-year-old girl I lived next to, and she used to ask me questions like, Dan, is the moon a boy or a girl? It's like, well, I don't know. What do you think, Maggie? But I mean, if she were asking that in Spanish, right, she would know very clearly that the moon is a girl, it's la luna. Uh, we don't have that in English. And so there's a certain um, limitation that we have when it comes to uh, talking about God. And in Greek, anthropos is a male uh, you know, it, it is of male gender, gender, ha anthropos. Um, and thus, we have come to translate it as man. And so the word man has come to be inclusive of all human beings. Until, of course, the 80s comes along and people like my mentor at Vanderbilt started to challenge that. You know, it's just that, you know, human beings have qualities that are not just male qualities, you know don't try to create this hierarchy of gender, you know, where male qualities are good and female qualities are bad. Let's start referring to humans as well as God in inclusive language. So we try, you know, even in our, um, our worship services, we try to do this, right? Uh, praise God from whom all, uh, what is it? There are, there are times in our worship service that I know the inclusive language is being used uh, that we used to use it in the exclusive way, but we're now using it in an inclusive way. Can you think of an examples? I, I can't. Dan. Yes. The doxology. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Used to be praise him, all creatures here below, and now it's praise God. Praise, all yeah. Praise God above ye heavenly hosts. And then you come to praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, Crossan wants to make the point that even in the New Testament, this one, this one, I think he's he's really stretching it a bit. In the New Testament, there are there are examples of times when the word uh, uh, father or or, or or a male term is inclusive of men and women. Uh, for example. Uh, in Acts chapter one, I should have got this before we um, before we started here. But you know the story, Jesus. This is the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven. And um, let's see if I can get a place here. I'm going to start in verse twelve of chapter one. Um, Jesus is meeting people in Jerusalem. Uh, and all of Judea and Samaria to, to the ends of the earth, I want you to go out and baptize the people, he says. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going out, they were gazing up, upward into heaven. Suddenly two men in white robes stood by them and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into the heavens will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now, we think that, obviously, we know that there are men and women both there, but the angels themselves just referred to them as men. And then we go on. Then they returned, they being the people who were up on the mountain, returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were uh, staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and all of the others, all these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his, as his brother. So we get the sense, right? They're, they're the 12, uh, well, I should say the 11 apostles that are there. But you have Mary, the mother of Jesus. You have women that are in the room as well. And Peter stands up and says this. Uh, in, those, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers um, I'm skipping over and said, brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Jesus. So he refers to that group of people, men and women, as brethren. 
it's it's interesting that some of the early texts also say friends, right? So this is this is a, a an argument that that Crossan is trying to make that when we think about father, when we think about uh, brothers in Scripture, we need to think of that in an inclusive way. Why why is that important? Because if we are going to start looking at the Lord's Prayer and aspects of God, if we are going to be too tied to this gender aspect of God, God as Father, it is going to, well, first of all, it's going to limit God and thus create the possibility of idolatry, right? There are many people who idolize God the Father, right? God's male, you know, Jesus called him Father, so obviously. I mean, have you ever thought about the absurdity of that, you know? So you're saying God is male because the Bible said so. Well, you know, let's take that out to its logical conclusion. I mean, we usually, though not recently, gender is a social construct, but sex is a biological aspect of, of, of who we are, right? And, and it involves genitalia. Are you saying that God has genitalia? <laughs> you know? So um, so it seems almost natural that we have to, to be very inclusive. So what Crossan wants to do is he says, when we refer to God as father, we need to hear in that the idea that God is both father and mother. Just as when Peter spoke to the disciples in Jerusalem and he called them brethren, he was referring to both men and women. Um, I don't think this is difficult for many in the First Presbyterian Church to grasp uh, or to accept, but it is still problematic in, in churches today uh, because as soon as you, if, if God is the model for male domination, right? For male leadership. As soon as you take the, the exclusive maleness away from God, you've also taken the justification for men's domination away from men. Uh, to begin to speak of, to, about God in inclusive metaphors is a threat to a male dominated uh, system. And so when we see very conservative evangelical churches, they will hold fast to this idea of the maleness of God. And Crossan, you know, this is the first hurdle he has to leap, you know, because it seems pretty clear from the historical research that Jesus probably introduced this, this prayer. If, if you wanna find one word that that we think the historical Jesus spoke, it was this word Abba, Father. And so Crossan is trying to make the argument right from the very beginning that we have to hear this in an inclusive way. Um, and he, he goes through several arguments and I, I don't wanna get into them so much here, but you know, he talks about uh, you know Old Testament references to parallelisms where father and mother are described in the Proverbs. Uh, one is always described with another. And thus, when we think about God as a parent, we should think of God as father and mother, but not just a parent, but there's something more, a new dynamic that uh, Crossan wants to introduce. And that is the idea of God as a householder. A father is many things, but in the Old Testament, or a parent, I should say, as many things, uh, in the Old Testament, you knew the quality and the uh, the wealth of a of a person by virtue of the family that they were a part of. Father and a mother who took good care of their house, you know, they gave their their servants a Sabbath to rest. They cared for their fields in a, in a very, um, you know, uh, ecologically sound way, I should say. They looked out after the welfare of all things. They saw themselves as co-creators with God. This is really important. And it, it's that this is what Crossan wants to make sure we understand. Our father should be heard as God who is the householder, God who is the the, the gentleman yeoman farmer or yoke 
you know, woman farmer, if I could use that, who cares for the land, who cares for his children, who looks out after those in need, all of those things that fall under the, uh, you know, the auspices of one who is a caretaker. Um, this is the person that we're praying to. And not only that, when we say Abba Father, this is the person to whom we are making the invitation. We are opening ourselves so that your householding spirit, the Holy Spirit, can work through us to be equally proficient as householders of creation. So let's just remove ourselves from gender altogether, remove ourselves even from parenting altogether and talk about a much more dynamic understanding of God as one who cares for creation. Humans as those created in the image of God who care for creation. So Crossan writes, the biblical tradition knows what a well-run home is, knows what it's like. It knows, therefore, how to recognize a good householder. The basic domestic model of the good householder, of the just and righteous, fair and equitable householder of the human home is extended to God, the householder of the world. God, the householder of the world house. Uh, you know those people whom you respect because of their uh, the virtuous lives that they lead, not just because they don't do bad things, but because there is an aura that extends from them to the world. You know, they care for their loved ones. They care for their land. They care for those who cannot care for themselves. This is something, this is a metaphor that we can attribute to God and, uh, you know, is scripturally based and one that has um, probably positive ramifications, especially for what uh, Crossan wants to argue. But before we can step into the next part of the Lord's Prayer, we have to acknowledge this new idea of, of what Jesus is saying when he says, Abba, Father. This is the creator, the caretaker. So let me let me stop there and see if there are any questions or comments. Dan? Yeah. It would seem that the behavior of the Israelites um, in, in um, handing down names and property from along a male line kind of mm -hmm. ran parallel to all this, right? Yeah, yeah, we can't so get around. Behavior, behavior sort of belied some of the actual attempts at in a wider meaning. Right. And then this is why I say this is a stretch for, for Crossan to try to make this, this argument because everything you are saying, and you know, and I've even said that, you know, there's a, a strain of misogyny that seems to run throughout the Hebrew Bible. But remember. God's revelation is a progressive revelation that has its final revelation in the person of Christ. Uh, and Christ was inclusive. Now, King David may not have been inclusive, you know, but, but in 1000 BCE, the Israelites' understanding of God was not inclusive either. It was not, uh, it, it was not, uh, full. It was not uh, completely developed, I should say. Um, and this is another difficult thing that, that people uh, will find is that, you know, they think that this book that we have here kind of fell from the sky completely formed. They don't recognize it as a, a testament, you might say, to a relationship that develops over 2,000 years. And even more so, you know, we are, uh, you know, we read the Bible knowing that this is a, is a living document, that our perspective in the 21st century is going to be informed in new ways by our understanding of God that weren't present in the first century. And Jesus' understanding of God is the result of a thousand years of development, interestingly enough, development that I'm going to talk about in, that, in the Sunday school class that really begins in the Babylonian captivity and begins with a, this understanding of God as a universal God, a God of all creation. David did not see God in that way. 
the early Israelites saw God as a tribal God, a tribal warrior God, right? And they had very tribalistic, nationalistic, if I can use the term anachronistically, uh, understanding of themselves. God was nothing more than a talisman, really, that saved them from the other you know, gods in the, in the region. But after the Babylonian captivity, there's just this new revelation that comes upon the people. Oh, my gosh. God, our God, created the entire world. And in so doing, there's the possibility that that God has a concern for all people, not just a chosen people. And if God is concerned for all people, all aspects of people, there's not one that's any better than the other. As Paul says, there's no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male and female. Well, you'll find that in the Bible, but you also find images, you know, of, of people who, who believe that women are uh, below men, you know, and you can probably find that in Leviticus and places. Um, so this is a, a living document that's always developing. Um, uh, so you can't just take it at face value and say, well, this is what the Bible says and I believe it, you know, because most likely if it says it in Leviticus, it's going to be challenged or contradicted in, you know, in Galatians or something like that. Um, so, but this is what Crossan is trying to do. He is is continually um, participating in or continually uh, offering a new understanding of what this covenant God who first was revealed to Moses, 1250 BCE, what this covenant God is all about. This is a marriage that continues. The marriage began, you know, out in the desert when we were poor and we didn't have a thing and we hardly knew each other. But now, 12, you know, 3,250 years later, we have a new understanding of God the spouse, if I could use that metaphor. And um, this is where Crossan wants to take us, this new way of looking at God. And so we have a genderless uh, metaphor to use, and one that is going to have ecological implications. This is also part of what Crossan wants to get across. God just doesn't care about humans, but all humans and the entire world as God, uh, the creator would. Um, so Crossan wants to unfold four aspects of this idea of God, the householder. First of all, God is the creator. This is that, that universal understanding of God, that God created the entire world. And if we understand God to be a God of love, then God loves the entire world. Not only that, creation wasn't just a once for all event. You know, God, you know, worked six days and rested on the seventh. But through God's spirit, creation is a continuous event. And we, through Christ, our belief in Christ and the, the work of the Holy Spirit in us, we are asked to join God in that event of new creation and that continuous act of new creation. It says in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new has come. We as a new creation, and we all also heard from Paul saying that we are heirs of God. And in our earlier uh, meeting, we talked about the Romans 8 passage where the creation was groaning in travail, awaiting the revelation of the children of God, waiting for us to get up and, and, <laughs> and take account of who we are as God's co-workers, as God's creators. Creation, not just human beings, is waiting for the redemption of the world itself. Uh, reconciliation for, uh, among those that need to be reconciled, and that includes the creation itself. And if God is our father and we are part of this household, then we are act, we are asked to act accordingly. You know, there's a story of the prodigal son, for example. 
there was a householder who, you know, was very wealthy. He had his two sons, but one just decides, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get out of here, you know? Well, the household retained its, its character all the way to the end, even while the prodigal was gone, or I should say the son who left, because the prodigal is a question as to who the real prodigal is in that story. Uh, but the prodigal returns and asks to be a part of that household. And that's the image that uh, Crossan wants to, to get across here. God the Father is the creator of all and asks us to participate in this act of creation. Uh, God as householder is also protector. Just as a householder uh, protects those who are under his or her care, uh, so does God do the same. We think primarily of children here. And God, from the very beginning, referred to um, the Israelites as, as children. Out of Israel, I drew my son. Uh, Israel is his son in uh, the story of the Egyptian exodus. Um, and so this son imagery gives us a sense of, uh, you know, the, the care under which we are um, uh, living, not just we as humans, but all of creation, the household is being taken care of uh, with great care. But also God as householder is a provider, one uh, who ensures that there is equality, equity in the household. You know, I, I once knew some uh, a parent who once said, yeah, I think, I know you're not supposed to have favorite children, but my favorite is so-and-so. <laughs> I was thinking back, I was like, really? So you, you're admitting you have a favorite child, you know, and you you give them, a, you know, favored care. Um, that That's not something that we see in, um, in a, a well-managed household. There's equitable distribution of resources. Those who have much do not have too much. Those who have little do not have too little, but all are being fed but especially the vulnerable. Throughout uh, the Hebrew Bible, we see uh, the admonition that you know, not to care for widows and orphans is to disgrace the, uh, the name of God. Not to care for widows and orphans is to disgrace the, the, the name of God. If you think of a patriarchal tribal society, um, those who are going to be the most vulnerable are, are, are those who are not going to have access to either, right? A widow does not have access to a father, to a, a husband under whose care she would have lived in, in at that time. And of course, an orphan the same way. So we have to be the caretakers of the widows and orphans if we are going to maintain the household of God as we are called for, because as we are called to do, because inequality, as Crossan says on page 45, destroys the household integrity. Let me read that for you, if I can. And I'm in the middle of page 45. What horrifies the biblical conscience in all those cases, all the cases that we're talking about, you know, we, we're supposed to care for the stranger within our gates, the widow and for the orphan. What horrifies the biblical conscience is the inequality that destroys the integrity of the household, and therefore dishonors the householder. In what sort of household are some members exploited by others? In what sort of household do some members have far less than they want and others have far more than they need? What sort of householder is in charge of such a house? So if in our household, we continue to allow inequality to persist, then it says something about our, our opinion of our greater householder of God, that God thinks this is okay. And Crossan says, by no, mo by no means is that the case. God does not want inequality to you know, exist in a world that has been redeemed through Christ. 
Um, any other any other comments about this? Uh, Dan? Yeah, Danny. This is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it relates. <clears throat> How many is Israelites at that time, uh, either in the Hebrew Bible or in the New, well, later in the New Testament, lived in small villages? Oh, many did. Yeah, many did. Um, and especially after the Babylonian captivity. This is one of the things that actually the king that I'm going to talk about, King Josiah, uh, tried to unify the people by making Jerusalem the place where they should all live. They should all come, you know, at several times during the year, you know. Uh, therefore, he can maintain a kind of a unified uh, understanding of who God was and who he was as king and things like that. Uh, after the Babylonian captivity, you had not just Hebrews living in what we today call Israel, but also living, some stayed in Babylon, others were in Egypt, you had what was known as the diaspora. So you had a variety of experiences as to who God was. But it depends on the time we're talking about. But of course, yes, uh, most people would have been living in small villages. They were small householders so to speak now i know that's an introduction to a question yes <laughs> where i'm going with this is i'm i'm thinking that it made more sense at the time of you know the hebrew bible and and jesus and the apostles um to think in terms of a household and the village writ large as the large household right. than today. Because I think the sociological and anthropological literature makes it very clear in just observation that population scale makes a huge difference. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, you know, can you really talk about, you know, the large household when you look at large scale societies today, you look at them 100 years ago, 200 years ago. That's that's a tough, that's a tough, uh, tough thing to do. Right. Not impossible. And it, and it also takes you away from the political metaphor that's often used as and that is God is king. Uh, if God is king, then the king under God is also god so to speak you know uh i i don't mean that literally but there can be confusion right uh the king can take on some of the uh prerogatives of of the divine and then and, and thus become corrupt you know uh the householder caring for his you know small his or her uh small household is something that we can relate to this idea of kingship and the king over all of the land is just way too abstract right and so this is reflective of really what jesus was trying to do and refer to god as abba not as not to god as king uh not to god as hashem the name who cannot be named above all other you know but bringing that down and making it intimate and making it uh, something that, you know, if, if anyone's blessed with any kind of normal life, they, they could relate to, right? A God who hangs out in the house, makes sure that the water is running when it's supposed to, and all are fed, who sacrifices himself for his children and for the good of his, you know, small community. It's really, it's really pretty ingenious if you think about it, um, because the metaphors we use are going to determine our 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 actions. And Jesus, though he talks about the kingdom of God, basileia, uh, in Greek, kingdoms were small entities <laughs> at that time that were closer to households than they were to you know the, these large you know nationalistic. Uh, things that we see rising out of the 18th and 19th century, you know. Um, so I, I think it's a good insight. Uh, you want to say more about that, Denny? 
love love when people talk. No, just to, um, I think operationally, it becomes increasingly difficult as we move toward where we are today with huge megalopolis, uh, you know, to replicate the understanding at the time that these prophets were, you know, engaged in their writing and thinking, either in the Hebrew Bible or in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, complex time period, and, and especially when you think of language as well. Uh, we are really quite blessed in that we don't have to speak but one language. But every language carries with it a metaphysics, right? <laughs> you know, like La Luna is the moon and it's female, but the moon is just a, a neutral kind of thing in English. Uh, and that's also going on and continues to go on the closer we get to the time of Jesus. You know, you've got Hebrew and eventually Hebrew is going to get kind of transmogrified into uh, to Aramaic. And then Alexander is going to come in with Greek. And then eventually the Romans are going to come in with Latin. And it's just an overwhelming mix. And each of the metaphysics that's connected with those languages is quite different. Um, but anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. But getting back to language, <laughs> uh, talking about language, I I don't think I want to take time to, to get into the fourth aspect of householder as model. But I do want you to give some thought to this uh, this image that Crossan gives us about the Lord's Prayer. And remember, we were talking about Abba, Father, and we were talking about the need to have prayers of both petition and thanksgiving on the one hand, but also of empowerment on the other. Crossan, I'm just going to introduce this, this here. Maybe you want to think about it over the week. Crossan is going to introduce this idea just by looking at the balance and the structure of the Lord's Prayer. There is this collaboration just in the structure, not even in the content. In the structure of the prayer of the self, there is this presumed collaboration that takes place between God the creator, God the householder, and humans as those who are living in the house. God the creator and humans as the co-creators. Uh, it begins in the first half of the prayer acknowledging the divinity of God in the heavens. There's also this, this vertical structure. As in heaven, so on earth. That is the transitional point in the prayer. And remember, in when we looked at the book of Revelation, we, we talked about, you know, in the end, the end times, the idea was that they, the new Jerusalem would come down out of heaven and would alight on earth so that a new heaven and a new earth would be created. You know, not the old one destroyed, you know, completely and then a new one, but but heaven itself and earth would come together and would would live in this kind of uh, collaboration. Thus, we see in the structure of the prayer, this heaven and earth, divinity and humanity working together. Think about the breath of God breathing into the body of, of Adam here. There is a collaboration that's happening. The first part of the prayer talks about the heavenly divinity of God. The second part of the prayer, or so we talk about God's name being hallowed. Your kingdom come, your will be done on as in heaven, then so on earth. The second part of the prayer talks about humanity. Give us, these are prayers of petition, give us our, our daily bread, forgive us of our debts, and then lead us not into temptation. But there is in this, not the separation that we tend to think of, that God's in heaven and humans are on earth. But if we are a new creation in Christ, then the spirit, the creative spirit of God is working in us to be members of that household, to be co-creating members of that household. What I think Crossing is getting at, and I hesitate to, to offer this, because people have such a, a misunderstanding of the, of the 
the Taoist symbol of the Tai Chi, uh, but you've probably seen it before. This is the idea of yin and yang, that in this world, there is heaven and there is earth, but in every bit of heaven, there is a portion of earth. In every bit of earth, there is a portion of heaven. And the two work together in kind of this creative uh, movement. Actually, it's counterclockwise, if I, I must say. Uh, they work together in this creative movement uh, so that the world can, can live in a sense of balance. And every bit of divinity, I should say, and every bit of the every bit of the Lord's Prayer, there's both the divinity and humanity working together. And this is a model for how we are to understand ourselves as a new creation. That we are collaborating with God. We are not slaves to the law doing what has been uh, commanded to us from without. But we are heirs to God doing what is encouraged of us from within. God dwells in us and we dwell in God. God dwells in us and we dwell in God. Um, I, though Crossan doesn't use this symbol probably because it's way overused and way too you know, um, commercialized these days, but it is an ancient Chinese symbol that represents the interaction, the creative interaction of what apparently seems to be op opposite. In every bit of cold, there is some hot. In every bit of male, there is female and, every, and vice versa. And the two of them work together in this creative dance. This is what we see in a different form when we look at the Lord's Prayer. In every bit of divinity, there is the collaboration of humanity. In every bit of humanity, we have the collaboration of divinity working towards uh, the uh, reconciliation of the world. And this has been introduced to us in the person of Christ. And the prayer that we pray, as we're gonna see from here on out, is gonna simply be a reflection of this. So that being said, I wanna give you the opportunity to ask if that makes sense or if I just completely lost you. Uh, I, I hope not. Well, thank you everyone. I'm going to um, leave you for now. When we come back, we're at the end of, we're near the end of chapter two. In fact, Dan, I, I think Will has a question, but he hasn't oh, got go his Will. audio. Go ahead, Will. Well, you're muted still. Now there can you, you go. I can oh, hear you now. I just wanted to say how much I liked your last statement. Two work together with in a creative dance. Right. Exactly. It really works. Well, and think about think about the Genesis image of you know a man shall leave his mother and a woman leave her home and the two shall become one, right? This is like I say this this is a marriage between God and God's people, of the two, each maintaining their individual identities, but working together as one, the two becoming one. Uh, I, I could go on about that and, and getting into the Hebrew word yada for knowledge. Uh, uh, but the Hebrew word for knowledge means to become one with, to know, to become one with, uh, to know something so intimately that you become part of it. Uh, it's quite different from our scientific understanding of knowing from without and objectively. So, but thank you, Will. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Dan? Yeah, Danny. I think we all need to think about the concept of identity, you know, then, you know, in the Hebrew Bible and the context of the New Testament. And in 2024, I think we're seeing increasingly people are losing their identity, except in some rather faux uh, movements, faux icons and faux movements and whatever that suggest to me an incredibly lonely crowd that David Reisman wrote about 60 years ago. Right, right. And I, and I think 
I think about names, you know, uh, these days, uh, I've got some faculty here that just had children and they get their names out of a, a book. <laughs> well, this is a name that I've never heard. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to name my child this, but in the past, a name was something, I mean, especially among native American cultures, a name you were given a sacred name that no one knew except you and the shaman. Right. And it had to do with your inner identity. And you were also given, and you know, in the Hebrew tradition, you're given a name that has that carries with it a long, uh, you know, a, a long ancestral uh, sense of meaning. Um, and we've lost sight of that. Names are just these arbitrary things that that are untethered to anything, you know, meaningful whatsoever. Uh, we have no household. We might say. I think that's kind of what you're saying. And those without households will find the easiest households that they can fit themselves into. And I, I think, Denny, you're right. We, we see that happening uh, today. So any other comments? Well, I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to see, well, what a nice full group. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're at the end of chapter two at about page 47, I think. Uh, yeah. And so if you want to read the next 10 pages or so, uh, 10 or 15, um, and please come with your questions as, as always. So thank you, George, for joining us. Appreciate having you.